to see you. Glad to uh, be in church tonight. I keep saying that, but I'm just so thankful to be back. And so I think that the uh, storms and some of those different things have kept some folks home. I know we've got some fallen trees. I've had a couple people text me. So, uh, you know, we'll just do what we got to do. Amen. And with two or three are gathered, and the Lord's here with us. So it doesn't matter how many of us there are. But anyway, uh, we'll go over a few things tonight some praises, some prayer requests, uh, some different events we got coming up. And uh, we'll share some of those. And, uh, I do want to just let everybody know and, and kind of let the stream know when we do our praise and prayer, it won't be right now, but here in just a minute, uh, we will start muting uh, the praises and the prayer requests just to kind of give privacy to some of those. I know that there's some uh, issues that some folks would have, and, and that's one of those things as you do it more often. You know, no, nobody's ever done this before, I don't think. We've not been uh, through this and had the live stream, so now that we are, we're seeing some of those things, trying to improve on what we're doing and, and, and what we're uh, putting out there. And so. Anyway, we'll mute that just for privacy's sake, so you can go ahead and give uh, you know full praise and prayer requests, whatever it is that uh, uh, can be more personal that we can pray for without making it as public as it has been before. And so we'll do that when we take our praise and prayer requests. But first, we'll start off with some announcements that we have. Again, <clears throat> as we've announced, we've got on June 28th through July 1st, we got the Nobles here. Uh, Brother Noble will be preaching to us, amen, and uh, we'll try to invite as many folks as we can. Again, uh, the outreach and the inviting looks a little bit different, but I think we can do a lot through our personal uh, witness throughout the week. Uh, I know as I've been thinking about it and uh, as it's been the front of my mind, I've been able to talk to more and more people. If I just keep reminding myself every day, every time I go out, this is my opportunity. I can't knock doors anymore. I can't do some of the things I used to, but this is my opportunity. I gotta keep, I gotta keep saying it and saying it and saying it to myself. I put my tracks in my car, so it's the first thing I see when I'm in there. Uh, just so I know that, that, man, this is your opportunity. So every time that you leave this building, there's your mission field, right? All the people around you. So don't forget, try to invite. And we'll do as best we can in uh, pushing that out. We'll put something online here this week. And again, once we get our printer issues solved, we'll, uh, we'll print some uh, different flyers and different things out so that we can push that uh, really hard, okay? So we're looking forward to, uh, to that at the end of June. And then in July, so so fast forward in July, uh, there the the first is when that revival ends. Just a couple weeks after that, we'll be sending our kiddos off uh, to a church camp, the 13th to the 17th. And I know that we've got a pretty decent amount of teens that are actually looking into it. I'm, I'm really glad to to hear about that. I've had a couple people come up and say, "Hey, we'll sponsor a kid to go." And if you are interested in doing so, uh, please make sure that you know all the information. There's some. Uh, flyers out of the welcome desk that has the cost and some of those different things uh, on it. I will say this as far as the camps go for those watching online and for those that are here tonight, um, there is a deadline on the registration date and even prior to that deadline, I know the capacity for the camp is at 600. Now I say that because I believe it was last year or the year before there were 750 kids there. So that deadline is going to hit like that. So we need to get our kids on and get them registered ASAP. Uh, and, you know, before we do anything else, we've got to get those guys registered because I would hate for them to not have a spot. It's a life-changing camp. It'll be a great week for them. It'll be wonderful. So I, I really would not like for our kids to miss that. So if you're interested, no kids that are interested, make sure that they get on and get enrolled, get their spot. I think all it takes, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the last time I registered, it was just a $50 registration fee and that does go towards the price of the camps so you don't have to worry but that secures your spot you don't have to have it paid in full until the date i think it's 10 days before camp starts uh, so anyway you can grab a spot for 50 bucks or the, or the, or the child camp and uh, the church will take care of some of those different sponsorships if somebody's uh, you know wanting to do that and would like to sponsor a child okay so i think that is uh, the information i will say this as well it's a uh, monday through friday friday morning they leave so Monday morning they show up, Friday morning they leave. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other information. I said it was a Wednesday night for the parent night. Not thinking, I wish I could have bopped myself in the head for saying that Wednesday night's church. It's not a Wednesday night. I was trying to decide if it was a Wednesday night or a Thursday night. It's a Thursday night uh, parent night. So that's when we'll show up, we'll take a van down. If you are interested in just seeing the camp, feel free to tag along with us. Uh, if you've got kids that maybe were thinking about it this year that don't go, bring them down, we'll, we'll pack them in, or we'll do some different car loads, whatever we gotta do to get people down there, we'll do that, and uh, you'll just get to see kind of what the camp is all about. You'll get to hear some of the preaching, uh, you'll get to see the kids and how they interact with it, and it, it's just, a, it's, it's such a blessing to see it. So, anyway, that's the parent night, that's that Thursday night, and uh, again, we'll go down, wish our kids that are there a farewell, right, and, and, and you know, say hello to them, and pray that they're having a good week and they finish it strong, so. 
Anyway, that is the camps. As far as the ladies go, in July, we're looking to have a ladies event. That uh, date will be posted here within this next week. Uh, my wife has some of those details, and so that'll be over in the fellowship hall. Again, we'll get that date posted. Uh, but I know that she's got some different ideas, and we'll start to develop a calendar on some of those different events coming up so that you can see it. They'll be posted out in front of uh, the times, are, you know, obviously where we are now, so that you can look at them and see them. And as we start to get the ball rolling with the economy and everything opening back up, you know, we'll be able to do more and more planning uh, to, to get, you know, further out ahead of where we are now. I will say this, in August, uh, you can look and, and expect for uh, a hog roast. We're going to do something like that and try to have an event out here in the field. Uh, didn't the Lord bless us with a lot of land? Amen. He did. So we're going to use it. We're going to use it for him. And I'm hoping to put a big tent out there and, and roast the hog and get some of these guys that know what they're doing, right? Let them demonstrate their abilities. And so uh, we'll do that and invite some folks and hopefully have a bunch of people saved. So uh, so we got, so we got some things coming up. So be excited. Be praying for the church that we'll grow through it. And that leads right into our prayer requests. And again, uh, for those that are online, we'll be muting it for this time. So don't think your computer's broken, your phone's not broke. We're just muting it, okay? Just wait a couple of minutes and we'll come right back, okay? So we'll give just a moment for that.
right. if you'll stand with me and turn to page number two. We're going to sing glory to his name. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. Page number two. Oh, the 
Amen. I like that one, huh? And heaven does sound sweeter each and every day. I'm telling you what, this world gets worse and worse, and I'm telling you what, it does sound sweeter day in and day out. It's almost like uh, when it's winter, right? Dairy Queen shuts down, right? It just looks better and better when it opens back up. I don't know how in the world. Where did I pull that one from? That was, that was out of nowhere. That was a bad one. Ephesians chapter 6, ignore that. We'll start in uh, verse number 10. Where we'll be tonight. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Uh, and again, very familiar verses, uh, but again, just so applicable to life today, talking about our spiritual walk and what we've got to do uh, in order to make it as Christians. I know that there's a lot of folks out there that want a uh, DIY video, right, on how to make it through life and all the success and, uh, you know, how do you get through this and how do you get through that and, and all these different things. And everybody wants the shortcuts and, and the easy ways uh, it's almost like those, those get-rich-quick schemes, right? They, they always look like they're perfect on paper, right? But then you try them out and they never, you know, hardly ever work like they do on paper. And so it's one of those things. But, but the Bible gives us a very sure and a very firm way to, uh, again, live our lives and how to uh, maintain our bodies and some of those different things to be able to be successful. And so we're going to walk through and look at some of the different things the Lord tells us we need to do daily in order to be, uh, you know, successful, profitable uh, fruit-bearing Christians. And so we're going to go through it. The Bible says this in verse number 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and powers, uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand the evil I'm sorry, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so we're going to go through and, and break down a, a few of these verses. You've got to forgive me if I stumble across words. You ever gotten sloppy with your pen when you underlined a Bible verse? Don't mark out the words. I'm telling you what, I must have been like on a road or something when I underlined this. It looks like I've crossed it out. So anyway, I'm trying to read through all my lines. But it says this in verse number 10, and I think that's where we've got to start, is in verse number 10 in order to, to fully get what uh, this section of Scripture is saying to us. And again, the Lord addresses the power of the warrior first. And I think that you've got to look at uh, our lives as humans uh, and you've got to look at where our power resonates from, right? You look at the world, and the world would say, well, your power resonates, right, with uh, how well you're in shape or how, uh, how much you train your body and some of the different things that you do. If you've ever watched boxing or UFC or so, I mean, there's some powerful people out there, right? There's a, there's a lady, I think her name is Rhonda something, I don't know, but she looks like she can knock anybody's teeth out, man. I'd be scared of her. You know, there's some powerful people out there. there there's them bodybuilders and... Yeah, they call one of them the beast, and I saw him lift over a thousand pounds. How in the world can a human being lift over a thousand pounds? It's ridiculous. And so, you know, there's some powerful people out there, but that's not what the Bible's talking about when it talks about the warrior's power. In fact, you look at, uh, you know, the, the men of old. The Bible speaks of giants, right? The, the, the people in Gath and some of those different... I mean, there were, there were some powerful people here on earth, but that's not what the Lord's talking about here. In fact, he goes on and... Uh, reiterates what he is actually talking about. He says, my brother would be strong in the Lord, watch this, and in the power of his might. And so the first thing that we've got to understand, and we know this verse is very simple, we've been over it before, and so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but our power is never in us, it's never in our body, it's always in him. In fact, when you look at preachers, and, and uh, I, I use preachers as an example just because it's, it's very relevant to us today, but you look at prophets, you look at anybody in the Bible that's been used of God, usually they're not talented people, right? They're usually not people that have anything in their own power uh, to make themselves anything. It, it's solely by God's power that they became anything. That's what I love most about what the Lord chooses to do. In fact, the Bible says it like this, God uses foolishness of men, right? And so he uses our foolishness to confound the wise. He, he uses the foolish things. He uses the weak things. Now, it doesn't matter what somebody is, the Lord can use anybody. And, and I love that about it because that's where his testimony shines brightest is in our lives where we are weak. Amen. Now, I love uh, David Ring is, is a speaker that I've heard a few times and I love his testimony. He's got cerebral palsy. Uh, and he is, you know, hardly able to walk and, and some of these different things. But you know what? He gets up there and he preaches. 
And he does. He, he, he speaks the Lord's word more powerful than you've probably heard from a lot of different people. And his body is flawed, and, and people say, by all means, he should not be able to do what he does. But nevertheless, there's the Lord right there using him. And so it's never our power. It's never what we can do. It's never what we can accomplish, right? Sometimes you'll feel defeated thinking that you can accomplish everything. And I'm telling you what, if you've ever tried to do anything, you can hardly accomplish uh, anything, right? It, it just goes slow sometimes, takes longer than you want it to. Uh, or, or maybe you're not getting the results that you hoped you would when you did something. But, but again, it's not for us. It's always for the Lord, right? And so he is the power and he is the source of our power for our lives. And so in other words, we don't have to worry about uh, that power ever running out. We don't have to worry about where that power is coming from. That source is unlimited and it never stops. That flow is eternal, right? It has no end. And so we don't have to worry about that. And, and I'm praising the Lord that I don't because I think I've had one too many toaster strudels through this whole quarantine. I'm glad it's not my power getting me through it. It's the Lord, right? So I'm glad I've got that power source. It says this in verse number 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And again, very simply put, uh, the Bible speaks of an enemy of ours, right? The devil. People say that Satan is God's greatest enemy. I don't think that that's true. I think that God has already stamped out the devil. I think he's our greatest enemy. I think we've got to contend with him, right? He's a, he's a big force for us to reckon with. But God's already stomped him out. He already knows how that's going to end. And one day the devil's going to be in hell and being tormented above you know, everybody else. And so I know that God has already finished that. But he is an enemy to us. He's a big enemy to us. Satan will come to our lives in any way, shape, or form that he can. And he'll try to get in in, in, in little tiny areas and, and affect us in big major ways. And so the Bible gives a, a way that we can resist him and some things that we need to do to be able to withstand him, it says in this day. So it says this, it says, put on the whole armor of God. So again, a warrior doesn't charge into battle with no armor on, right? Unless he's a knucklehead, uh, he's going to go out there and he's going to get, you know, destroyed if he's got nothing on. We need armor. We need something that's going to protect us from the devil. Again, we are, are flawed people. We're powerless people. You think of a person and, and what power we have. You know, I made a joke of it a second ago. Getting big and muscly is about all we can do, right? There's no uh, magic. There's no sort of uh, superpowers. Or I mean, we are really limited to what we can do with our hands and what we can invent. We're, we are really powerless people. When it comes to spiritual things and the things that exist in the spiritual realm, the, the, you know, what's above our heads every day, the battles the Lord is fighting, we have no power against those things. Uh, it'd be very uh, naive for any person to think that they could handle Satan with their own physical flesh. Don't you dare challenge the devil. You can't take the devil. I was at camp one year, and uh, uh, Tim Carter was speaking about a man and, and how flawed a man was and how overpowered the same thing I'm speaking about now. And he says, be careful. You'll get high-minded, and you'll think that you can take the devil. And I talk about a couple friends that I had, and, and this was just one of those teaching. This is one of those moments when the Spirit swooped down and, and just taught us all a lesson all at once. And uh, Camp Chautauqua has this big prayer garden. It's beautiful. It has a big fountain in the middle of it. It's, I mean, it's just gorgeous. Flowers planted everywhere. they got the trellises with all the vines wrapping around. It's just beautiful. If you're a kid who's from the city, you've never seen anything like it, right? You go there and look, it's just beautiful. And so we do uh, a devotion there early morning at camp. And, and it's not uh, a nest, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a mandatory meeting, but it's a, one of those if you'd like to go and you're a servant and want to go learn, you can learn. You can get an extra message in before the morning message. And so we used to go. So that's what he was speaking about, is, is power and where it comes from and how to resist the devil. And one of my friends, he's a twin, and uh, in his head, he said, I can take the devil. They're, they're, I can take the devil. I can handle him and, and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, he was sitting on top of an iron bench. They've got some real nice iron benches all around the, uh, the prayer garden. And he was sitting there with, uh, I believe, I don't want to get this wrong, I believe it was his brother and it was another girl. And anyway, they were sitting on this bench. And he said, sure enough, the moment, and, and I'm telling you, it's dead silent. It's like, I, I, can't, I can't remember what time it is. I think it's either 6.30 a.m. or 7 a.m. We're all, you know, kind of waking up still. It's camp. We were up late the night before. You know, we're all getting geared for the day and trying to get spiritually fed. And, and just as soon as he had that thought come through, he said, the iron bench snapped. Mm -hmm. An iron bench snapped, and the leg came up and whacked him right in the chest, knocked him back, knocked the two other people off the bench. <laughs> And it, I'm telling you, it happened. It was the loudest thing you've ever heard. And all of us just looked over. I mean, these people are laying on what in the world just happened. And uh, nobody knew what had happened. You know, the, the bench exploded. Until that night during the service, nobody really knew what had happened. 
And Tim Carter called him up on stage in front of, you know, five, six, seven hundred kids. And he said, tell us what you learned this morning. And he said, well, Preacher Carter was preaching about not being able to tempt the devil or uh, take the devil. And in my head, I thought I could. And as soon as I thought that, a bench snapped and hit me in the chest and knocked me on the ground. He goes, you know what? Preacher Carter said, and, and I agree with them, that the Lord was teaching me a lesson. You have no power. You've got no control. And I'm telling you, don't you think you can take Satan? Don't you think you can tiptoe around sin? Don't you think that, that you can get close to it and resist? Listen, the devil will win every single time. And so you and I need to be very careful what our thoughts do and, and where our minds end up because we're prideful people, but we don't have all the power to back it up. So here's what he says. He says, put on the whole armor of God, knowing that the only thing that we have to defend ourselves against the devil and against the spiritual things and wickedness in high places is what God provides for us. We've got his power. And we've got this armor that he gives us that we put on, watch this, every day. Does a armor, uh, sorry, does a, a warrior put his armor on once, right, and take it off and never put it on again? No. He puts it on every time he goes into battle. And we understand that every day we fight a spiritual battle. So it says this it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, all the different things that the devil's going to throw against you. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Again, we've been over this verse. You might think it's physical things that you fight against. You might think you're fighting physical wars. It's always spiritual. Always, 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 always it's spiritual. It might come through the form of a physical issue, but it's always a spiritual thing happening. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And again, I told you this before and I'll tell you again. I believe that there's something happening right over top of our heads that we don't see. The Bible talks about somebody praying, and then in, in the midst of that angel coming to answer that, answer that prayer, the prince of, I can't remember if it's Sardis or Tyrus, or I'll get those names mixed up, but anyway, that, that, that prince, that fallen angel, withstood that angel. They had to fight until they could deliver that prayer request that God was trying to get back to that man. And so here's what I'm saying. There's something going on over top of us that you and I don't see each and every day, right? We go about our lives and, uh, you know, happy-go-lucky and, and jolly and, and, and have no idea the spiritual warfare that God is literally fighting above our heads. It's amazing. In fact, I'm so interested to see what exactly that looks like when I get to heaven. All that goes into one day in human life, all the, the, the billions of souls that God is taking care of, all the billions of things. I mean, just think about it. It's, it's amazing what's going on right over top of our head that we don't even consider in a day. It says this in verse number 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be with, uh, uh, able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. And we've stopped and talked about this verse as well, having done all to stand, right? We have got to stand. It's not enough to sit. It's not enough to, to, you know, to try a little bit, but we've got to do all to stand, right? We've got to go out of our way, and we've got to go past what's comfortable, We've got to stand. It's not always the easiest thing to do. It's not always the most convenient thing to do. But we've got to stand. And we've got to stand strong and stand in the Lord and stand fast, right? The Bible uses so many different words to describe what we've got to do as Christians. But we simply put have to stand. Not get lazy. Not get burnt out and sit. We've got to stand. It says, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore. Very next words in verse number 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about truth. I want you to see something. One of the most basic things that allows somebody to stand is truth. When you know what you're fighting for, when you know that it's true, when you know that it's the only foundation, listen, it gives you strength to stand. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes waiting in line can be hard, right? You know, you're standing, especially if you guys have been Black Friday shopping. Anybody been Black Friday shopping? Okay, you're not crazy enough. I have. Uh, my, my, uh, my wife, was my girlfriend at the time and wanted me to go Black Friday shopping with her and her family. And we stood in all kinds of lines. My family used to do that for electronics and silly, you know, Christmas presents. And I, I do not like Black Friday. I don't like doing all that. I don't like standing in line. I don't like dealing with all those people. It's crazy. But I can tell you what, it makes it a whole lot better when you know that there's a McChicken right at the end of that line or when you know there's a, a nice pretzel or, or a, a cheap iPad or whatever you're, you know, whatever you're waiting for makes the standing worth it, right? And so we know uh, because the Bible says that your loins be girded with truth. And so you think about the loins, one of the most, uh, you know, open spots of the body, one of the most, uh, the feeble spots, right? And the Bible says right there, that's where truth is to guard you. 
right there where it hurts the most, truth is what's going to guard you in that place. That's what's going to keep you standing, is truth. What happens when the whole world crashes in? What happens when everything comes against us? Listen, I don't care what else happens. I know I stand on truth. I know that if I get in this Bible and I read and I mark and I do all the different things, study that I need to do in my Bible, listen, I know that I can stand because this is truth. I know when I show up to a hospital and somebody's dying on a, a hospital bed, they don't need to hear anything else in the world besides what I have to say about this book. Amen? What God has penned for them. We'll feel like we're wasting people's time. We'll feel like we're inconvenient. We spoke about that just on Sunday, right? Feel like you're a burden to somebody because you're giving them the gospel. This is the only thing they'll ever need. What helps us to stand? We've got truth. We have the absolute 100% inerrant truth, and that's what allows us to stand in this evil day. So what protects your loins? It says truth. It says this in verse number 14. It says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So it talks about the, the loins, and then it talks about the heart, right? What, what guards your, your heart and, and what prote uh, protects one of the most symbolic parts of the body, right? Your heart, what's can easily be corrupted and, 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 and all those different things. Your heart is something you want to protect, right? In all the movies, that's how people die. You know, they get stabbed through the heart or whatever it is. I don't know. That, that's just known to be a weakness of mankind, right? Is the heart. It says to protect that thing with the ble uh, breastplate of righteousness, right? We have righteousness because we've been saved. What protects our heart, what keeps us from wickedness, what keeps us from the, the, the natural man and the carnality that we are, the breastplate of righteousness that you and I wear, the blood of Jesus Christ, that, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> that was shed for you and me, right? That protects our hearts. That protects us from the wickedness and all the different things that would so easily pierce us, right? That, that salvation is the number one piece of armor that you and I have that blocks all those different things that come at who we are, right? So the breastplate of righteousness, we wear that salvation, you know, some people say this. They say that we've got to protect the Word of God. We've got to do all. Listen, I can't do anything to protect the Word of God. I can try and I can I can fuss and I can do everything. The Word of God protects me, right? And that will always be how it is because God protects His Word. God is who originates that power. And so that salvation, the Word of God, all those different, that is what guards me. That's what guards my heart. That's what keeps me and keeps all those different things away from me. So your loins girt about with truth. Uh, your breastplate of righteousness says this in verse number 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Notice how the Bible applies the gospel to our feet. It's very interesting how it does that, right? The, the feet are one of the, the things that you think about least when you think about armor, right? You always think about the helmet and the breastplate and the shield and, and all those different things, but hardly do you ever think about the boots. Well, why in the world does the Bible uh, equate the gospel of peace to the boots? Well, it might be because right before Jesus ascended, he said, go ye out into all the world, right? And what takes us everywhere? Our feet. We go. It, it sets our course. The gospel of peace is what literally maps out. It's our GPS. It's what takes us to the world that we live in. How do we get around? How do we navigate uh, through this world? How do we make it through all the spiritual wickedness in high places? We've got the gospel to lead the way. It's what guides our steps, it's what leads us, it's what takes us, right? And it's what protects us from the world. So uh, it's very simply put, you and I need to be taking that gospel out into this world. So our feet are literally led by this gospel of peace. Not only are we protecting ourselves, but we've got a mission to deliver the word of God uh, to the world. Amen? It says this in, in verse number uh, 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And this is a very interesting one because when you look at the actual word shield and look it up and what it means in the Hebrew or the Greek, uh, what it literally means is it's talking about a specific shield called a phalanx. And I don't know if you know what that is, uh, but it's an interlocking shield. And what it was and back in the day is there would be armies with these shields. And I might have been saying it wrong, but it, it's spelled like that. And what they would do is it'd be a tall rectangular shield, about six feet tall. And what they would do is they'd get right next to each other and they'd plant that shield. And the next guy next to them would plant the shield. And the next guy, and before you knew it, you had a, a big line and basically a big wall of these shields. Some would angle them and hold them higher than others. And they could make domes out of them so they could protect themselves from aerial, uh, aerial assaults and arrows and some of those different things. And, and it was a shield that would fill all the gaps. And so here's what the Bible says. That shield is our faith, right? Our, 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 our shield is our faith. Our faith 
is what absorbs all those different darts that Satan is trying to throw at us. It's very easy for us to picture an old-time war, people shooting arrows. Arrows were the guns of, of the olden days, right? It was a, a force that could hardly be reckoned with, these arrows. they come out of nowhere. They were silent, right? They were these little darts that would pierce you. Man, could they cause a lot of pain, right? And so these shields were made big. They were made to cover all these gaps that none of those little tiny arrows would get in. And I'm telling you, that's what our faith is. Our faith covers all those different little gaps that you and I will have in life. It covers all the little things where the devil will try to crawl in. It'll cover all the, the little tiny holes that you don't think are there. Uh, it, it'll cover all of those things. It says to hold that shield out and let it deflect all those darts. Let it absorb all those darts. So they're not hitting you, but they're hitting that faith that we have in Jesus. Amen? It also goes to say this, and, and again, this is a point that I think needs to be made, and it goes a step further, but if it's a, a group effort, the shields... Right? Then you don't want to be that weak link. Right? You don't want to be the one that has a shield down. You don't want to be the one that's standing too far apart and left a gap. You belong to this body. You're holding a shield. Right? We are all collectively protecting this body from Satan. So we need to hold our shield. I don't want to be the weak link. I don't want to be the, the chain link that gave way. Right? I don't, I don't want to be the chink in the arm. Whatever you say, I don't want to be that piece that was insufficient right, to block the evil from coming in. I want to do everything that I can to be strong and to hold that at bay. And so we need to take that shield of faith and we need to apply it to our lives every single day. Not only to wear the armor, but man, we've got that shield out in front of us so that nothing even makes it through that shield to even make it to our armor. Isn't that amazing? So our faith is our shield. It says this in uh, verse number uh, 16. It says, taking the shield of faith where, uh, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts uh, of the wicked. It says in verse number 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It says twofold in this verse. First of all, the helmet of salvation, right? What guards our head and our noggins, right? Which so often get uh, led in different areas and, and, and get led astray. Salvation, right? That, that, that thing is literally uh, what keeps us. Our salvation is what keeps our thinking solid. It's what keeps us on track. It's what keeps us grounded. All those different things. That's what our salvation is does for us. It sets the course and the mission and all the different things that you and I need to have. And so without the world getting into our heads and trying to indoctrinate us and trying to give us all this junk, right? It's junk. Can we just be honest? It's all junk. When the world's trying to indoctrinate us and get inside of our heads, listen, none of that's getting in. Why? Because I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. My salvation is keeping all those different things out. God is the one preserving my mind. He's preserving it from all the different things the world would try to throw at me. Now listen, the mind is something we've got to really take care of. You put on the helmet of salvation, but the next moment you take it off and the things that you're filling yourself with are the things that are corrupting you. You know, I had a guy that, and this is just a really silly illustration. A lot of my illustrations are really silly, things that I've just gone through in life. A guy tried to get me to play a video game. And I'm like, man, I've seen commercials for that video game. It's not a very good video game. I've seen lots of inappropriate wording and blah, blah, blah. I said, I don't know if I want to play. He goes, what are you talking about, man? He goes, are you a kid? He goes, it's just a video game. And I said, no, but what you're not getting is what you take in is what you become, right? What you're allowing to be absorbed into you, that's what is affecting your day. You, you don't believe me? You start, listen, start listening to secular music. Start watching secular TV. Start, you'll start to catch yourself saying the things that they're saying in your head. You hear curse words over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know what? In your head, you're going to start mouthing some of those words. You might not say them verbally, but they're there. Some of the things that, that men and women are seeing nowadays that they're allowing their eyes to see is it's here. I'm telling you what, you might not see it because you can't see inside of me. It's there. You're affecting yourself. Your mind is being corrupted. Uh, they talk about uh, this addiction that, that people have to looking at things online, and they say that it literally develops almost like a tar or a layer on your brain that is impenetrable. It literally damages the brain to the point where you can no longer enjoy what God had once made holy. It corrupts it. It ruins it. And so men and women can't be satisfied. They have to go to different things. Listen, the same thing with drugs. It affects us in a way that, that we literally cannot be the same afterwards. We've got to be very careful. They, they talk about these addictions, and, and they say the damage that it does to the brain cannot be reversed. That means that the longer you spend in it, the farther your, your brain goes, you're not getting that back. You're going to have to deal with it for the rest of your life. It's like you're creating scars in yourself that you're going to have to address daily. 
You're never going to get over them. They're, they're things that you're going to have to contend with. All. So listen, here's what I'm saying. We've got to be so careful what goes into our heads. We've got to be so careful what happens to our body. Listen, and why? Because I know that my head's kept with salvation. I know because I'm saved, I'm a new creature. I don't need all the things I needed before. I don't need to go to the world. I don't need to look for different revenues and avenues. for. Th- I don't need to look for all that stuff. You know why? My salvation keeps me from all those different things. And so our head, our mind, our brains need to be protected by that salvation. We've got to always trust in that, not looking to the world for those different things. And then it says this. It throws it in there with that verse. It says, uh, uh, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Notice the only uh, attacking attribute that we have, right? The, the only defense, uh, or I'm sorry, the only offense that we have is a sword, right? But it's not even a sword, right? You say, if, if the Lord's going to give us a sword, man, then it better be a big one with flames and all kinds of... No, he says it's the word of God. That's our sword. So as a Christian, we're not swinging a literal sword. We've got the word of God. This is what our attack is. This is what our offense is. Everything defense, this armor that he gives us to defend us from the world, the only kind of offense that you and I have is the word of God. And so that's what we've got to take to this world. That's what we've got to be using to pierce the hearts, right? It says the, the word of the Lord is sharper than any two-edged sword, right? And it says it pierces even the dividing and the sunder of souls. And so we know that the word of God is what's doing that work in the world's life. That's what's doing the work in the, in the lost people. That, that is our only offense is the word of God. We ought not use anything else. And so we know and we realize that, that we make our path with this book. Uh, if you think of an adventurer or somebody in the wilderness, right, and they're walking through a, a heavily uh, dense jungle, right, that has lots of foliage and different things, what do they do? They cut it down with a machete, right? The only way I can navigate through this world, the only way that I can make it through is with that sword that God gives me, the word of God. And so we've got to learn how to use it. You, you go back in time and, and look at the young men. They'd start them young, these boys that would be in the military and, and, and different things. You know, they would start them young. They'd play with wooden swords. That's how they'd start them out, wooden swords. And they'd spar and they'd do all these different things. And uh, when they were old enough, they'd graduate. They'd have real swords. They'd have practice dummies. And, and then they'd take on real drills, right? And they'd be using real swords. They didn't just throw them out there with a sword and say, go get them, bud, right? They, they'd get, you know, filleted. They'd get slaughtered. That's not how he does it. So, so does God expect us as Christians? He just hands us a sword and says, go get him, bud. No, of course not. God wants us to know how to use our sword. We ought to know how to swing it. Watch this, so that we don't get cut. It's a two-edged sword. Remember that? So that we don't get cut. You use a verse uh, inappropriately, right? Or you use it for the wrong way. Or Listen, you'll kill people. You'll kill people and you'll kill your reputation, right? That people don't look at you the same. Because you're using the word of God in a way that was never meant to be used, right? I know uh, so many different examples of, of Christians using verses and pointing them out and, and saying all kinds of weird, nasty things. What, what in the world? Where did you pull that one from? Oh, I got a verse right here. I was stopped at, at the Tinker Outlet Malls up in Jeffersonville. I don't know if, if you know where that's at. It's up by Leesburg, where we used to live. Uh, in courthouse, Washington Courthouse. Anyway, and I was there and walking around, and my wife got us Chipotle, right? And I love Chipotle. I love their burrito. I love their burrito. Anyway, and that's not the point. So uh, we were there. We were going to eat. We were at the playground, and, and Grant was going to play. I don't believe Grayson was. If Grayson was born, he was just little tiny. Uh, so anyway, he was in a stroller. I don't remember what it was. Anyway, and she had gotten Chipotle, and they forgot her fork. Right? It's like when you go to McDonald's and they forget the straw. I don't have straws in my house. Right? I need you to give me a straw. So nevertheless, they forgot this fork. And so I was on a scavenger hunt all the way across this tanger out them all to find my wife a fork. And so I, I'm walking everywhere. Nobody has forks. The subway didn't have forks. The blah, blah, blah didn't have forks. The food court was shut down. I was so steaming mad by the time that I finally found my wife a fork. Now I'm on my way back to my wife, and I get stopped by this guy. He says, do you believe in God? And I'm like, well, what in the world? I'm a children's pastor at Hillsboro. I'm like, let's go, buddy. Let's do it. You know, we, we're either going to agree or we're going to disagree in some major fashion. I'm like, yeah, of course I believe in the Lord. I said, I'm a, I'm a children's pastor at Hillsboro Bible Baptist, and he said, oh, that, that's really neat. And he said, uh, have you ever heard of Mother God? I said, what? He said, Mother God. I said, okay, show me the verses. So he starts pulling out all these arbitrary verses about Israel. The Bible calls Israel a she, and he's applying that to God. I mean, he's bringing out all these verses. He, he thinks he's got the, the whole cavalry behind. He thinks he's got all the equipment in the world to prove. And I'm like, dude, none of what you're saying makes any biblical sense. 
And so I went through and walked him through it, and of course we agreed to disagree. He, he had his ways set, but, but here's what I'm saying. People know how to misuse God's word. People know how to, to take the verses and, and tangle them and, and, and mix them up and make them mean all kinds of... Listen, we need to know how to use the word of God. Because we need to know how to divide correctly, right? And, and we need to know how to really swing that thing so that nobody is getting hurt. I will say this as well, Christians. For those of you that do know how to use the Word of God, don't misuse the Word of God. It's one thing to know how to swing a sword. It's another thing to use it intentionally to kill somebody, right? The sword in and of itself is not evil. The same way a gun in and of itself is not evil. It's the wielder of that weapon that causes the evil to happen. And so the same thing is said about the Word of God. There are some people out there that will use it, listen, and they will kill people. They'll take it. You, you've probably heard them called Bible thumpers or, or something like that, and they'll hit people over the head. Listen, the Word of God is a weapon, yes, but do we do we smack in people's face and do we you know argue and, and, and act like hooligans? No, we don't do any of that stuff. Why? Because it's never going to bring glory to God. You can win anybody with the word of God. I shouldn't say this. You can't win anybody. The Lord can win anybody over if they open up their hearts to the gospel. Listen to this. But you're not going to win them, hit them in the head with the Bible. Right? You, you go to a family's house and, and you start talking religion. And, uh, you know, people talk religion, right? They don't necessarily talk Jesus. They talk religion. And you bring up Jesus, right? You talk, start telling about Jesus. And they don't want anything to do with Jesus. It is not your job to take their face and put it in the mashed potatoes, right? And, and, and force them. To accept Jesus. That, that's not your job. The Spirit does that, right? The Lord has to be the one to do that. And so we need to use the Word of God properly and appropriately. We'll kill people. I'm telling you, we will kill people if we know the Word of God and use it incorrectly. And so we've got to be very cautious what we're doing and, and how we're using it, that we use it appropriately, because we're going to give an account of what God has taught us and what God's allowed us to learn and how we used it for the Lord. <coughs> So here's the reminder. Here's the, here's the simple lesson for tonight. It's easy. It's almost an object lesson, right? We can break it down piece by piece. I love those lessons that are so simple. And, and, and we can make it, you know, apply to our lives. And here's what it really is. Every day, we've got to prepare ourselves to meet the world. Every single day, we've got to prepare ourselves to meet the world. It takes one day of not putting your armor on to get killed. It takes one piece of equipment not put on properly to get killed. You can have every piece of armor on and miss the breastplate, and guess what? You're dead, buddy. You can get every piece on and leave the helmet off because you've got great hair, right? You're dead, buddy. You, you can, it doesn't matter what it is. We've got to take every piece, put it on, watch this, and not miss a day. Every day. And then train with your sword. Know the word of God that you know how to use it. And so we've got to, we've got to work on it every single day. And whether we realize it or not, we are warriors. I know that's a really cliche saying, and people use it to say, but, but I'm telling you, we are fighting a spiritual battle. You might not see it, but it's happening. And you're a part of it. You're a soldier. And you're going to give an account for what you've done with, with your body and with your armor and all this. And you'll give an account one day to the Lord. You're going to want to have an answer. So let's learn how to fight. Let's learn how to defend. Let's learn how to, to allow God to work in our lives. But then this, putting on that armor every day that we're able to withstand the evil in that day. Amen? Isn't that good? Isn't it good the Lord gives us pictures and things that we can use? I love it. Let's do this. We're going to pray. If you'd stand, every head bowed, every eye closed, we'll pray. Allow the Lord to do work in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, love you. I'm so thankful for you. Lord, maybe somebody in here, Lord, tonight has, has gotten slack or, or Lord, gotten complacent and has maybe stopped putting on the armor of God, period. Know, Lord, that there's so many things going on through our day. Lord, but we should never make the mistake to not fear, or to not to seek you first. And God, we always need to seek you first. You're the first person we should consult each and every day. And Lord, we need to go to you. We need to ask you, Lord, to guide us and to protect us. We need to make a, an intentional uh, uh, move, Lord, to put on your armor, to, to put you first and to put you at the forefront of our minds. So, Lord, maybe we've gotten slack. Maybe somebody here, Lord, has, has forgotten to put you first in their day. Lord, forgive, uh, forgive us if, if, if that's us. Forgive us if, if we forgot to put you first. And Lord, if we've missed anything, God, help us, Lord, in the future to be more prepared. Help us to be uh, considering you, Lord, and putting you at the forefront of our lives. Lord, I pray for each and every person here tonight and each of those watching online, Lord, that you would challenge them in some way, God, to be prepared to meet the world that we walk out into every day. 
Lord, you've saved us and made us a new creature, but the fight is not over there. Lord, we've got a, a world to navigate through. Lord, but thankfully it's in your power and it's with your word. And so God, help us, Lord, to, to use it in the right way. Help us, Lord, to navigate through this world unscathed. And then, Lord, this, I pray that you'd help us to use our sword. We forget that our offense is your word. God, I pray that each and every Christian, both here in person and listening online, would understand and know the importance of learning and, and using your word appropriately. God, I pray that you'd make a, a point tonight, Lord, to teach us that lesson. And so, God, whatever it is here tonight that somebody, Lord, needs to get right with you, I pray that you do your work in your people's hearts. Lord, this altar is open, and God, I pray that you do your will and your, uh, your way with your people. And God, I pray, Lord, that, that you would have your, uh, your will done in this church. And God, I pray that you'd have your way with your people. I pray that people be saved, but Lord, first, we've got to get our lives right. We've got to learn how to reach this world, and we have got to take care of ourselves first. So, God, do your work tonight. Pray that you'd move. Pray that your spirit would be filled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed.